Let us hear then the written word of the Lord from the Old Testament, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Isaiah 8, 16 through 20. Bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for Yahweh who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teaching and the testimony? If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Matthew 15, 3 through 9. Jesus answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. John 20, 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Acts 17.11 Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. 26.22-23 To this day I have had the help that comes from God, And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Colossians chapter 2, 2 through 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. 23. These indeed have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. 5.20 and 21. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So far the written word. We ask, O Lord, our God, by your Spirit you will help us to understand the revelation that you've given through the prophets and the apostles as being sufficient for what we must know in order to be reconciled to you, to know the Lord Jesus and to worship him. We ask, O God, that we would be content and thankful for all that we have and that this would form us and transform us to the image of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
As we have been studying the Belgic Confession of Faith, quick reminder, the Belgic Confession of Faith is just a summary of the teachings of the scriptures and not a substitute in any way. I know you don't believe that, but you will be accused of these things as many seeking to sound holy will say that, well, I just need the word of God and I don't need all these man-made documents. Well, these man-made documents are not meant as substitutes, but rather as teaching aids. When you buy a book and you're going to read it quite often, you have a table of contents. The table of contents is there to aid you, to give you a feel for the flow, to know where you will be and how much longer there is. And so the confessions of the church are in that same way meant to be an aid that helps us to delve into the word of God so that we would obtain from it more fully what God has said, especially in a world in which there has been, you know, our own limitations, whereby we are not aware of everything when we read scripture, we could misinterpret, but also because there are heretics and liars who have sought to deceive us. The confessions of the church help us to see here are the errors. This is what you're going to run into. Be aware. Here is why they are erroneous. And here is the true teaching which gives life to the dead. So it is in that way that we use the confessions. But you will notice that we have extraordinary amounts of scripture to show why we get our confessional summaries. And that's what we are continuing to do today. We have been looking at the word of God. We know that God has revealed himself both in creation showing order and power, but in special revelation in the scripture, extending mercy, grace to us who were dead in sin, and that this mercy comes in the person, God made flesh, Jesus Christ. And so we are speaking of now this revelation, the special revelation, the written scripture. And today we are looking at article seven, here titled the perfection of scripture, or as we have it in the sermon title, sufficiency of the Bible. In other words, we are declaring that we believe as a church, we confess that this is our faith, what God needs for us to know to be reconciled to him is sufficiently revealed in the scriptures and we need not go outside of it. In fact, we must avoid going outside of scripture and adding to it. We must rest content. And by doing so, we actually obtain the truth rather than as the world would say, that we are actually deprived of some knowledge by limiting ourselves to the scriptures. Now, in saying this, we are not saying scripture is sufficient for everything in life. It is not. It does not teach us science. It does not teach us technical matters. It does not help us write poetry. It is about revealing Christ to man. So we are not claiming if we just have the Bible and nothing else, all will be well. It is not saying that at all. We are saying for being reconciled to God, that this is what God has given, and it is the only thing that works, and everything else would take us away from that. Let us begin first by looking at Acts 17. Here the Apostle Paul writes that the Jews were no, I'm not, uh, the writer of Acts, probably Luke, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Now what makes this group more noble? They received the word with all eagerness, and they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, what's interesting here is quite often you get this idea that in the church, it really tends to be for vain men, many cult leaders, many popes, that they want authority for themselves, and they expect you, the people, to receive this word that we are giving as authoritative. Don't question it. But here you see in the scriptures itself, you are commended. You are actually called more noble when you examine and test what is being told to you. Because you believe God has spoken. You know all men are naturally liars and prone to error. And so while you receive with eagerness and joy the word of God, you also go back to test and verify it yourself. And we are told that is an incredibly good thing. Rather than dishonoring the minister or even dishonoring these confessions, by testing them, you are bringing honor to God because you are saying, I know that God has spoken. I know that God has a people. I believe I am one of them. And I know the spirit will confirm these things to me. So indeed, we encourage you, do not ever just submit to the teaching of a minister who 
as a human, can err. Rather, force him to prove what he is saying and examine it to be sure that it is true. And by so doing, not only are you noble, but you are more likely to know and understand the truth. You see in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, don't despise the prophetic word that is given to you, the scriptures, but test everything. And when you see that it is right and good, cling to it, hold fast to it. So you see this model. So it is for that reason why we argue out all of our theological points, all of our heads or doctrine, so that you would know that you are receiving the pure word of God. You are warned in Isaiah that you should always turn to the Lord to learn from him because the rest of the world is chirpers and mutterers who would seek from the dead words for the living. Whereas we have the living word of God being given to you, the testimony and the teaching given to his disciples to conform them to the image of Christ the Son. And you see from Psalm 119, this word is a lamp. It is a light. It guides us. And as you see, that same idea picked up in 2 Peter, it is a lamp in a dark place. For the time being, the scriptures are what what reveal God and the work of Jesus to you until the day comes when Jesus himself, the light, will be amongst us and there will be no more need of the sun. So the word of God, the scriptures have an incredibly high place and they are to be taught, received with eagerness, and examined and studied so that we would know we have the truth. But we must understand human tendencies, including yours and mine. And that is to fall into patterns of men. We may create new and bizarre ways of worship, but more often we will fall into old traditions. And this is what Rome, the Greek Orthodox, many others rely on, as well as all heretics and liars. They help you, they claim, by adding things that scripture does not command and saying these will be more helpful. And indeed, in some fields of life, they are. There are habits that you can build up. There are things you can do. And so they are looking at these things and saying, let's do them also. But you can see as Paul writes to the church in Colossae, he warns them not to get away from the truth, which is Christ himself, and to recognize that Many things in the scriptures we're all looking forward to and are fulfilled in Jesus Christ so that they are no longer proper for us to do. But worse than that, there are people who believe that they are getting angelic revelation even today, that the spirits speak to them and they are adding to the word of God and to the practice of worship in the church. And we are being warned away from these things. And you can see what he says there in Colossians 2.23. These things have the appearance of wisdom because they promote devotion, self-made religion. But in reality, they are of no value. Now, many of you have probably seen people who are very dedicated. It can be an athlete. It can be a scholar. It can be a surgeon. But also the monastics. I mean, certainly when you read of some of these people, on the one hand, you can speak of them as crazy because of their devotion. But to a degree, also you... Rightly, I would hope, have some admiration for their level of dedication. And the danger is, people see that and they say, well, if this person was so dedicated and this was what they did, then perhaps that is how also I should show my dedication. Because look, they have that asceticism, severity of the body. They have given up all things. All they want to do is sit in a cave or on a pole, literally. That was something that was done for a while. And just pray and meditate on the word of God. And we are told, in the end, these are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Just because you're distracted for a time does not mean that you're being purified. You can get, and you've probably had this happen to you, for a time because of something you have to do, you forget other things. Now, the danger of that is, uh, so let's say that you're depressed about something going on in this part of your life. So you throw yourself fully into work, you know, which is productive and good. Or it might be that, you know, you turn to drugs, alcohol, whatever else. You're hoping to forget this. But the thing is that you're not actually forgetting it, nor you're working through that. Rather, you're distracting yourself. And that only works for a time. And in the end, is of no value to fixing the problem over here. And that's the danger of much of what you see in uh, ritualistic religion. 
is that it is an attempt to get you to think you are something that you're not. What we need is the pure word, the sufficient word that tells us, indeed, your problem is real. And don't ignore it. Don't be distracted. Face the problem head on. You are a mortal who has sinned against the holy God. And there is judgment coming upon those who are ungodly. Here is grace. Find genuine peace in the grace of Jesus Christ. And the word given is more than sufficient. Is there more to know? Of course. Even the Apostle John writes this. Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. It's a simple declaration. In this world, God gave greater revelation than what is preserved for us today. But notice what else he continues to say. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, what is sufficient and necessary is preserved for us. So instead of wondering about those missing pieces, you know, what did Jesus do between the time when he was 12 years old in the temple and when he turned 30 and began his ministry? It doesn't matter. It wasn't necessary for your salvation. And so to listen to people trying to reconstruct these things is foolishness. And then when it comes to the Lord's Supper, we know that Christ is giving himself to us, not physically in the bread, but uniting us by his Holy Spirit to himself. And it's a testimony. How does that work? It's a mystery. It's not given to us to know those details. So it's not worth pursuing the details. Rather, rest in the testimony that it is giving you are mine, united to me, so much so that as my body is in heaven, you will ascend to heaven itself because now you are members of my body. Receive that testimony and be glad. And be careful not to become holier than God by changing his word. And you see this quoting Isaiah, Jesus speaking in Matthew, says that you guys claim you have this high, high regard for the word of God, so much so You've put fences around the commandments. So, I mean, think of it this way. God says, do not work on the Sabbath. On my day, cease from all your work. Well, the way you would fence that is you might say, okay, we won't work a day before and a day after either just to make sure that we do nothing on that day. Or you create all these additional rules and rituals. There's different ways that you can do that. Uh, And what Jesus is saying Actually, you wind up negating the word of God when you do this. And he gives a clear example. Having gone away from the simple teaching, they even went to the point that they directly contradicted the law, but they thought they were being more holy. You're commanded to give, in the Old Testament, one-tenth of the increase of your your productivity that year to the temple for the service of the the priests uh, so they can serve on your behalf offering sacrifices to God. Well, if God is asking for a tenth, wouldn't giving a fifth be even more honorable, going from 10% to 20%? Certainly, if 10% is honoring God, 20% is double honor to God. And what about 100%? Well, when you do that, if that means you now put your parents in poverty, you're actually sinning against God. Now, in your mind, well, God wanted X amount. I've given all of it. But in the meantime, you've dishonored your parents. That's what Jesus says. By your tradition, you have allowed people to dedicate all their money to the temple. But in doing so, they have abandoned their duty to honor their parents and care for them. And therefore, you break the command of God by your traditions. And that's why we always want to re-examine everything we say and do and see if it conforms to the word of God. Because it, we are no different than these Jews that we may wind up in trying to be more holy, which is a very noble and a good thing, that we wind up getting caught up, unfortunately, in focusing on a detail and thereby missing the larger picture, which is what has happened here. And what does Jesus say? This traditions of men, these commandments of men, take us away from God. And that's why in the Reformed churches, worship is simple. The reason for that is, while there are things we could add that would, you know, cause maybe more emotional response, the way the cults do it, where they force you to do more work, which causes you to feel more connected. But these are all psychological tricks. We don't want to do any of that because 
these traditions of men then become a substitute for the word of God and they would take us away from Christ who is life itself. So we want to make sure that we preach the pure word of the gospel. You see there in Acts 26 that you are being told nothing more than what God had revealed through the prophets and the apostles and we demonstrate they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ who is a light to you. And we don't want to do anything, even things that would seem to add to true dedication like asceticism and severe treatment of the body. We believe these things will actually take you away from Christ himself. And so we want the word which is light itself to shine. And we want to focus on these things knowing that they are the only hope we have of knowing Jesus Christ. So we don't want to despise what God has given, but to, throughout our lives to test, examine, see if these things are true so that we would find in Christ Jesus our hope of life. So these are the ideas that you see summarized there in Article 7 of the Belgic Confession, which says the following. We believe this Holy Scripture contains the will of God completely and that everything one must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it. For since the entire manner of service which God requires of us is described in it at length, no one, even an apostle or an angel from heaven, as Paul says, ought to teach other than what the Holy Scriptures have already taught us. For since it is forbidden to add or to subtract from the word of God, it plainly demonstrates that the teaching is perfect and complete in all respects. Therefore, we must not consider human writings or teachings, no matter how holy their authors may have been, equal to the divine writings, nor may we put customs that we enjoy, the majority, the age, passage of time, or persons, councils, decrees, or official decisions above the truth of God. For truth is above everything else. That is why even though we use the confessions, notice we force ourselves to prove that the confessional summaries are faithful to the scriptures. Therefore, we reject with all our hearts everything that does not agree with this infallible rule, as we are taught to do by the apostles when they say, test the spirits to see if they are of God. Also, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. So what we want to do is to strive to understand what is right and true to find in the word of God joy because he has given to us all that is sufficient so that we guilty and polluted sinners would not be judged but rather we would be delivered from death to life and knowing that he sent his only begotten son and remember the costliness of that Paul elsewhere says how will he not with Jesus give us all things what do you think is missing from the scriptures did God leave you this void to try to discover on your own. Never. He has given you all things necessary that you would find the light of the gospel showing you Jesus Christ. And until we see Jesus ourselves fully, this is the light we have in the darkness. Let's pray. We ask, O oh God, to, to continue to diligently test the spirits, to examine the word, and to find in your scriptures the word of life. We thank you, Lord, for this word now being so easily available, and we pray that we would not become contemptuous and seek something else. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are become too accustomed and sometimes feeling that it is boring to repeat the same things. But Lord, we know that if we do recognize our sinfulness, that these are words of joy that refresh us each time. So we pray for your spirit to work in our hearts and minds, in the hearts and minds of the sisters and brothers of this assembly and of the church around the world. And lastly, for this gospel and the hope of life to be extended to many. May not only this light shine in the darkness, but may blind eyes be opened and given sight so they would see that they are indeed in darkness and flee to the light and find life in Jesus. We know the word we have is sufficient Teach us not only to have confidence in these things, but to go forth boldly, proclaiming the excellencies of your grace, by which the Spirit of God will draw to you the people whom you have chosen to be your own. Amen.
As we continue, we will sing Psalm 101. And remember, again, the context here. This is in book four, and it is speaking of a wonderful thing. And you see here that knowing that they are in judgment, in exile in Babylon, because they did not listen to wise counsel from God, but rather to fools who led them astray. Here in Psalm 101, the one who with joy and thanksgiving has entered the courts of God now affirms, I will put an end to foolish counsel and receive wise counsel only in order that I may not only be restored, but that I may dwell forever in the house of the Lord. Let us stand and sing Psalm 101 of steadfast love and justice. <laughs> 